Okay, so we're continuing within the one spirit, and this is part two of chapter four, where John Henry Rhodes does his final letter about what it's like in the afterlife. And this is followed by some information that he gave my great grandmother about the physics of the two worlds, with some clues on how to communicate more easily between them. The following experiences relate to my father's helping presence and were written and sent to me by a very dear friend of mine. These experiences of my daughter, Celia, took place when she was 11 years old and continued from 1902 to 1920. The first visitation of what she called an influence appeared to her the morning of the passing of a dear friend whom we called Uncle Henry Rhodes. Previously, while he was near us, he had told her that while she lived, he would guard her as his own, and should he die, he would become to her as a guardian angel, which was to be proof to her. The passing of Uncle Henry occurred at 5 a.m. on April 1st, 1902. At that time, my daughter and I were in Bisbee, Arizona. Between 6 a.m. and 7 a.m. that day, my daughter awakened me sobbing and crying, oh, mother, Uncle Henry is dead and has come to bid us goodbye. He is right here now, mother. Can't you see him standing beside us? Can't you feel his hand upon your shoulder, mother? Oh, she cried wildly. Uncle Henry, don't leave us. You're the best friend we ever have. And then throwing her arms around my neck, she said, oh, Uncle Henry feels so bad to leave us and he's crying too. After a while, she said, he's gone. But he told me, mother, that he'll come back again and help us when we need it. After much hysterical sobbing, finally around eight o'clock, she went to sleep. At nine o'clock, a messenger boy rapped at my door and this was the following message. Henry died at five this morning, burial at Little Falls, Minnesota. From time to time, sometimes days, sometimes only hours intervening, he would appear and talk with her, counseling and advising. These visitations were as often in the light as in the darkness. After some time, my daughter discovered that she could summon him by simply calling by day or night. As the weeks passed, this power grew stronger. Our business was calling us to different parts of the country. The following autumn, we were in Fort Worth, Texas. One Sunday morning, I had arranged to visit friends in Dallas, taking the 7 a.m. train. Suddenly, while I was preparing to leave, Celia sat upon my bed saying, Mother, you must not go to Dallas on that train. Uncle Henry is here, and he says the train will be wrecked and many people will be killed. I was very impatient and said stuff and nonsense and other things to that effect. You and Uncle Henry have run me around by the nose long enough and I'm going on that train. At this point, she grew almost violent, sobbing, even shrieking hysterically. Uncle Henry says, I must not let you go. He is walking up and down and he's swinging his arms, begging me not to let you go. This was a habit of his when he got excited. This is a side note from Harry. I could not leave her in such a state so I took the 9 a.m. train, which was detained because of the wrecking of the seven o'clock train, which resulted in the death of 14 or more persons. This is but one of the many instances, another of which occurred in Chicago a year later. During a streetcar strike in Chicago, we were at the intersection of State and Madison, the busiest of the Chicago streets. The crowd became so dense and the agitation so great, I feared for my daughter's life and started to pick her up in my arms when suddenly her face lighted with, a, with pleasure and she said, oh mother, Uncle Henry will take us through. And to my horror, she started across State Street laughing with childish glee saying, Uncle Henry can push his way through. As if by magic, the crowd parted and we walked safely to the other side with Uncle Henry continuing to guide us through the crowd to Wabash Avenue, where we got the car. During the same year, a total stranger came to me in a theater saying that he was a medium and was directed to tell me by a Henry, and he described him in accurate detail, that through the intrigue of so-called friends, I was being deprived of money and property which belonged to me in a Northern state 
at the same time advising me on how to prevent this loss. Finding it difficult to leave, I let go unheeded, and I have bitterly regretted it ever since, as following events proved that Henry's worst fears were realized. This letter was signed C.G. Maitland. These friends died not long after the letter was written. On April 3rd, 1921, my father wrote, again through my hand, some paragraphs about the law of vibration, how to, to help me understand how the communication between his world and mine works. My child, let me explain to you this morning that the communication between our plane of life and, and yours is no more beyond natural than is the wireless telegraphy upon your plane something supernatural. All laws are natural laws made by the creator of all life and knowledge, and no law of nature can be changed in its entirety, although an overriding of a law can apparently happen when one is ignorant of the real law and conversant with its only its outer sense. The fundamental law of vibration will be found to hold good on all planes of life, although the, how it manifests may be different. Remember, there is but one law, but that it has power to work in many directions. When men study to its last analysis of the vibration, they will comprehend the unity upon all planes of the universe of the one great law of vibratory force. When one has become conversant with the law in its manifestation in telegraphy, wireless or otherwise, he must see at once how simple a matter of communication is between the different planes of life. Further, he must eliminate the idea of distance, for we are not far apart. It is the difference in this rate of vibration which must be overcome, not the distance in space. Our difficulty lies in finding an instrument in tune with us, and having succeeded, we have little trouble or the trouble can be overcome. It is a known fact that wireless messages can be sent nearly twice as far in the darkness as in the light, owing to the interference of the light rays. We also find our work much easier in the semi-darkness. In fact, some of the more difficult work we can do must as yet be carried out in the darkness. This is because of our own lack of understanding and the lack upon the parts of our instruments or mediums. When we have learned to make the working conditions perfect, we shall be able to manifest with equal ease in light or darkness. Take for instance, clairvoyance. Very often a man becomes clairvoyant only when in great weakness, as those ill or near passing out of the body. But as he develops clairvoyance, usually with our help, he unfolds the inner sense of sight, which can register much higher rates of vibration than the physical eyes take in. And in time, he can see our forms, although they are much finer, with as perfect ease as the physical form about him. It is simply a matter of getting the focus. This is true of clairvoyance, clairaudience, and other forms of mediumship. One thing that I believe is not plain to most persons so far is that fear, hate, skepticism, and similar thoughts and feelings produce very low vibrations, which make it almost impossible for us to work effectively. Faith, hope, love, and all thoughts of a high and unselfish nature raise the state of vibration and set in motion forces through which we can readily work, that we may, in our small way, lift humanity higher in the scale of evolution, which means nearness to God by unfolding love. The signature of this document was indeed my father's. He sometimes makes me feel that he and I are looking at exactly the same truth, but seen in somewhat different facets. It is an awe-inspiring realization to comprehend, even a little that the same laws govern all life, even in its farthest reaches. As Nassen expressed it, on all planes of life, truth is manifest. When man uses his mind, he is awed and astounded by the universal wisdom which he finds on every plane. He is bewildered by the grandeur he sees and wonders what place he has in it. Then he finds the great universal law, which acts in all solar life, has also worked for him. He has been created in conformity with all created life. Therefore, he is a part of the universe that is evolving toward perfection. 
But if he sees only the overt manifestation and fails to glimpse the infinite intelligence which created them, he is confounded. Do you think that the myriad forms of this same energy were built without a pattern? And that even you yourself were created from a cell of life with no blueprint? No. You know of magnetism and electricity, of attraction and repulsion, of affinities and polarities. But to miss the basic fact of spiritual love, which we call God, is to miss the key and the meaning of life. Nassen's appearance in itself was a vivid experience of communication across death's barrier for me. One morning during the hour of prayer, my right foot felt heavy. Looking down, I saw that the foot was encased in a heavy overshoe, which was lined in sheepskin. The bottom of a heavy pant leg was visible for about 10 inches above the shoe. I heard one word, Nassen, spoken twice. The next morning, when I sat down to meditate, I saw that I was dressed in the complete suit of an explorer. The material was like a very heavy serge. It was waterproof and kind of a gray blue in color. And it was also lined with sheepskin. And again, I heard the name Nassen. Then this man named Nassen began to speak to me. He spoke deliberately, enough so that it was easy for me to write down what he was saying. In, in fact, I was scarcely conscious that I was writing so clearly, I seemed to see the scenes that he was describing. It is usually th that way. The words I hear seem to bring into sharp focus the scene or the person or the, even the idea that is being presented. Although I followed Mr. Nassen with high interest, I realized that when I had finished writing that I knew almost nothing about the man except a vague knowledge that he had been some kind of explorer. Soon afterward, I met a friend of his who told me about Nassen's distinguished career as a scientist and explorer. From many pages of record, I lift a few notes. During my life on Earth, my great desire was to find the magnetic North Pole and to search for the secret of the Northern Lights, their power and influence upon the Earth and its inhabitants. When I stepped from my physical body, I found myself guided by someone invisible to me. As we floated along with ease, I gained enough courage to reach out toward the one who seemed to propel me. Soon I could see the outline and then the figure of a fine appearing man. He smiled at me reassuringly and told me that he had been sent to pilot me to the interim. His mention of floating along with ease did not especially impress me at the time, but since then I've heard the same description from other people. Also, I've known persons who have had a peculiar clairvoyance and are sometimes able to see the spiritual body take its departure from the physical at death. They say that the, the spiritual body seems to rise into the air and seek its equilibrium, almost as a child might in learning to walk. Other figures are frequently seen to approach the newly freed individual and offer assistance, even to demonstrate the new locomotion. If the newly dead individual is given courage, either by those who love him on earth or by those who meet him in the new dimension of experience, then he is soon able to make his way easily and freely. Many of us have vivid dreams of this sort of locomotion when we may be making our way in quite a natural above ground and to move without friction or effort. I've wondered if these dreams are really a memory of an excursion taken by the spiritual self while the body sleeps or perhaps a memory of past deaths and liberation. Certainly a greater mobility in space seems to characterize persons in what Mr. Nassen called the interim. I often turn to Mr. Nassen's rather long but vivid description of his experience and growing understanding in the new world to get my bearings afresh. This paragraph never fails somehow to amuse me. This feeling of amazement and relief in being free of the physical body without being diminished as a personality seems to be a common experience. So frequently, the feeling of awareness of being dead seems to be kind of a, well, this is it. Or living after death is, in fact, after all. And religious persons who profess to believe in an afterlife are often among the most amazed when there's also astonishment that the world continues to be the same world, or at least that the new universe contains the old. It isn't so much that the time space is different as that one 
is so much freer in it. For instance, doors, which formerly appeared as solid matter, are now experienced as porous and penetratable. A good deal of the physicists tell us that there are aggregations of matter loosely held together, the finer matter of the spiritual body and the higher vibrations of the spiritual body apparently pass unimpeded through the lower vibrations. All in all, the many communications I have received about death, as well as the fact of being in close touch with those who are called dead have given me a feeling of being at home in the whole universe. As Wordsworth has said it, there is one great society alone on earth, the noble living and the noble dead.